Hello. It's nice to see you all. Good morning to you. And of course, to those watching on Zoom, it'll be good evening to you. But uh, welcome anyway, as you join with us today. I'm going to read some words as we open our worship. God, be merciful to us and bless us. Look on us with kindness, so that the whole world may know your will, so that all nations may know your salvation. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, because you judge the peoples with justice and guide nations on earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. And so we're going to sing as our first hymn, May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. on him and our lives focused on him some words from um, Paul's letter to the Romans and first of all from chapter 1 and then from uh, chapter 12 the power of the gospel is the heading in my Bible I have complete confidence in the gospel it is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself, and it is through faith from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. And then in chapter 12, so then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us all, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. 
Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. And because of God's gracious gift to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you should. Instead, be modest in your thinking and judge yourself according to the amount of faith that God has given you. We have many parts in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of the one body. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, we should do it according to the faith we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously, and whoever has authority should work hard. And whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. May God add his blessing uh, to his word. Recently, I um, read the story of a group of rowdy young people deciding that they wanted to have a bit of fun. In the building where the youth group was meeting was a piano. And together they decided that they'd have great fun if they pushed the piano down the stairs to see what would happen. Of course, the result was inevitable. The piano was wrecked. What the punishment was, I don't know. But hearing what had happened, an elderly gent heard that the... Uh, Smashed piano had come to grief, so he brought it home uh, to his own garage and he began to work on it, restoring it to its former glory. And it's that kind of story that we like to hear when bad situations have been turned around. Indeed, when people's lives have been changed. In Paul's wonderful letter to the Roman church, he is going to set out, as one writer puts it, with meticulous care, how the readers of his letter can be put right with God. Nothing could be more important than this. And the key to all this is faith in Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. God sent Jesus into the world to be our saviour. So I want to touch on, on three things as we share together this evening. First of all, open hands and open hearts. Some scholars suggest that verse 17 in chapter 1 is the key verse of the letter to the Roman church. The person who is put right with God through faith shall live. Or as other translations have it, the righteous will live by faith. I want to suggest that this is about opening our hands and opening our hearts to him. I've learned over the years the importance of uh, opening our hands to receive from God when we come in worship. According to research published in 2010, so it's, it's quite old, but uh, published in the British Journal of Psychiatry, experts estimate that 60% of communication happens non-verbally. Strong relationships rest on good communication skills. And since so much of our communication happens with our bodies, it follows that what we say silently is as important as what we say aloud. And this research goes on to say, crossed arms can give and suggest defensiveness, a desire to protect oneself, or a lack of willingness to 
share information. And counsellors will say this too when people come to them for counselling. That if they come with folded arms, <laughs> they're not really open and ready uh, to receive. Have you noticed some people in worship, they want to use their hands. And not just to play the piano, which we're very grateful for, or the flute as well. But they'll raise their hands in worship. Or they'll open their hands to receive. Their arms may be down by their side, but open their hands to receive. And this, of course, challenges me. Because do you know that uh, sometimes, well, it bothers me because, do you know my favorite position when I'm listening to a sermon? I'd like to, there we are, look. It's happening to sound today. Spiritually, though, I don't want to embarrass you, but spiritually, does this suggest a desire to protect oneself and not being open to receive from God? In the Gospels, God revealed his righteousness by punishing sin through the death of Jesus. In the resurrection, he revealed his righteousness by making salvation available to all who open their hands by faith to receive from him. By opening our hands and opening our hearts, the letter to the Romans puts it, so we become justified by faith. We probably all know the um, uh, opening words of uh, Psalm of. Um, Chapter 11 of Hebrews. And uh, it begins, uh, and this is the translation I was, I was brought up on, of course, but uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But I, I like the, um, the message translation, which says faith is our handle on what we cannot see. So before holding a, hand, a handle, what have you got to do? You've got to open your hands to grasp the handle. Open our hands and opening our hearts to receive God's freedom, God's generosity, God's love for us. But secondly, it reminds us, open our hearts and open our minds for here in, in uh, chapter 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I remember the days when uh, what was called uh, testing the meeting used to take place, where perhaps you'd have a, a special preacher or a special service, and, and at the end of the service, the meeting would be tested. And uh, the pastor, maybe, who hadn't preached, perhaps, but who would stand up then and uh, remind us of what the preacher had said, and, and then he, he would test the meeting, and he would say something like this, that those of you who would like to give your hearts to the Lord, will you remain seated while all the rest of us stand? That happened to me. How old was there? I think at the time remembers it. But when we think in terms of the way Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, in the Lord's name I warn you, do not continue to live as the heathen whose thoughts are worthless and whose minds are in the dark. And in Colossians, you have been raised to life with Christ. Keep your minds fixed on him. May the mind of Christ my Savior stay with me from day to day. You see, society, society wants to control our minds, doesn't it? And why is why is advertising so important on the TV or in the newspapers or magazines generally? They want to get inside our minds, don't they? They want to control our minds. But of course, God, by his spirit, wants to transform our minds. Scholars tell us, when you think of the transfigur transfiguration of Jesus that that word comes into our English language as the word metamorphosis. And it describes a change that comes from within. 
There are plenty of pressures around us these days to, uh, to change our minds, but the Holy Spirit change our minds by releasing power from within. I read somewhere, if you want, uh, if the world wants to, if the world, sorry, controls your thinking, you are a conformer. But if God controls your thinking, you are capable of being a transformer. Uh, Nick Fawcett, in one of his, uh, his books, tells the story of his children visiting a hall of distorted mirrors. We probably all had that sort of experience over the years in fairgrounds and so on. And uh, Nick Fawcett says they ran from one to another with squeals of delight and laughter, rendering them short and squat one moment, and then with the legs of a gazelle or the neck of a giraffe the next. Then he said this, such distortions are nothing as compared with those we can create with our minds. We can let our minds run away with ourselves. But it's about opening our hearts and opening our minds to God to think of him and through him. And then, thirdly, it's about opening our minds and opening our wills. Some commentators tell us that uh, Christian dedication involves three steps. One, you give your body to God. Secondly, you give God your mind. And thirdly, you give him your will. Many people think they can control their wills by willpower. I got strong willpower. It's when we yield our will to God that his power can take control and give us the willpower we need to live for him. In private prayer, we surrender our will to God and let him have his way with us. It's about being willing to use our gifts. Different people have different gifts and uh, some people have a, a high opinion of their own gifts and not afraid to, to say so. The story is told of... Um, of Bill and Hillary Clinton out in a, a car journey, the former president of the United States, of course, and out in a car journey, and they stop for petrol. And a man walks out to help them, and Hillary su suddenly shouts, Charlie, is that you? I can't believe it. She jumped out of the car. They hugged and they chatted for a while, hugged again, and Hillary got back into the car. Who was that then? Bill asks. Oh, that's actually her former boyfriend, she said. With a rather smug look on his face, Bill Clinton said, just think, if you had married him, you'd have been the wife of a petrol station attendant. No, said Hillary, if I had married him, he would be the president of the United States. <laughs> Who's got the gifts? Who's in control? When we let the Lord control our minds and our hearts and open our hearts to him and be willing to use our gifts for him and his glory. We should learn from prayer and so learn from God and indeed from trusted friends. If we're not sure what our gift is, talk to people. I remember a dear lady coming to visit me many years ago and I had been preaching on gifts, and she was bothered about it, and she wasn't sure what her gift was. And, and uh, she said, I, I can't stay too long, she said, because I'm going to visit so-and-so uh, down in the town center. And I said, well, do you do this often? Yes, yeah, she said. Pray maybe that is your God-given gift. And she went away with a measure of joy and appreciation in her heart, in her heart. Here in Romans 12, in Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul makes it clear that every follower of Christ has been given at least one unique gift. Vital to the church, vital to the body of Christ in the world. 
And one modern writer says, I'm sure that if he had been writing today, he would have been keen to add helping with public address systems and digital technology or leading worship or floral arranging. And so the list goes on and on. The Holy Spirit gives us the right gifts to make his church effective, to, effective today. And we have to open our wills to him and be willing to serve. Open hands and open hearts. Open hearts and open minds. Open minds and open wills. Let's come to God in prayer. But before we actually pray, I had the message from Tony Best just as he came in to inform us that uh, Janet Kearsley has passed away. We knew she was seriously ill and have been praying for them, but I don't think we expected things to happen as quickly as has happened. And so we remember them in our prayers. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord, we come before you today, yes, conscious of such news as has just been shared with us. We pray for Roy, we pray for the girls, we pray for the family and all their many friends who will miss the gifted Janet. And we pray for others too who have lost loved ones or who are anxious about them, going through difficult times and difficult illnesses and situations. And we commit them to you. But Lord, we come before you today as well, conscious of the fact that we often emerge from the darkness of night with our hearts burdened by fears and doubts and problems, unable to see beyond ourselves to you and to others. Reach out, we pray, and touch our lives again and restore us through your love and renew us in your service. We confess that sometimes our worship of you does not come over as though it is wonderful and joyful. Instead, perhaps becoming an empty routine which we perform out of a sense of duty. It's not that we consciously turn away from you, Lord, but simply that the spark which once filled us and fired us with hope and enthusiasm seems to have gone damp and cold. As William Cowper puts it in his hymn, Oh, for a Closer Walk with God, he asked the question, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? So, Lord, we are conscious of all of that. But today, too, the Queen's speech is being delivered in Parliament at this moment, and not by Her Majesty, but by Prince Charles we pray that she might be well enough to experience and to enjoy the up-and-coming celebrations. And we pray that this speech today might bring a measure of hope to those who are in desperate need. In the wider world, Ukraine is constantly on our minds and in our prayers. And so we lift them up before you once again and pray that peace might reign there soon. We pray for persecuted Christians, people who are starving, that we will always be aware of them and respond to their needs. And so all who are unwell, we pray that Gethin and Claire, along with others, some in hospital, some in care homes. We pray that you will renew their strength and uh, that we'll see a measure of more normality around again. So hear these, our prayers. Bless each home and family that's represented here today or on the screens tonight. And hear our prayers as we offer them in the name of Jesus who while on earth 
uh, taught us to pray. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, as thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to our final hymn, uh, one that is loved uh, by us all, I'm sure. And it's the Lord's My Shepherd and the Stuart Townend Version. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you, and I will trust in you, for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with all and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his And I will trust in you.
So we ask, Lord, that you will take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and speak through them. And take our lives, that they might be an expression of your love at work in these days. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all today and forevermore. Amen.